Hello, thank you for joining us for another exciting adventure in the Word of God. Before you get into the message, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you today and we thank you because you are God all by yourself. There is none like you. You're the only true and living God. There's no other God but you. We worship you, we glorify you, and we bless your name. We lift up your name and honor you. For Lord, you are our creator and you are our sustainer. And from you we receive peace. From you we receive unspeakable joy. And from you we receive great abounding love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Now I ask that you would anoint these lips of clay that I would be an oracle of your will and of your word and that I might please you in all things and that your people will walk up right before you and that it, they will receive your word, your truth, not mine, but yours and apply it to their lives so that you will be glorified in all that we do. We ask this in the name of your dear precious son our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I come to you on behalf of the leadership and membership of New Life Ministries Church in Plato, Missouri. And to share with you in obedience to the Lord what I believe he has given me for this day and this time and season to his people to warn, to encourage, and to edify that we might be that generation that he is calling for in these last and evil days. As you can see, our subject, repent before it's too late. Now, repentance involves humility. There's a certain amount of humility that is required in repentance. Because if you don't believe that you've done anything, you're not, you're not going to repent. If you feel like uh, you're right in everything that you do, you're not going to repent. But if you're wrong, if you have done things that are in conflict with the holiness of God as prescribed in the word of God, then you need to humble yourself under his mighty hand, repent by confessing your sins, knowing that he is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But as I put there, before it's too late, that's the caveat, before it's too late, because when it's too late, then repentance is of no use. It is no longer valid. Uh, once the jail uh, cell doors cling shut, and your sentence began, it's too late to confess and to uh, ask for the mercy of the court. Because once the sentence has been, been issued and judgment is carried out, it's too late. So that's why the Lord is saying to us today, repent before it's too late. We're going to start off in Genesis 18 chapter in the 32nd verse, this is a conversation between Abraham, who is called the friend of God. They're having a friendly conversation, and uh, God is telling Abraham he's going to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's going to overthrow those cities. He's going to destroy them because of the unimaginable sin and debauchery that was going on there. Uh, similar to what we see in our own society happening, where they have taken the standards of God and turned them upside down, turned them on their head, so to speak, uh, calling good evil and evil good, uh, taking the standards that God has placed and uh, calling them uh, as being unrealistic and saying that they are uh, are not true standards and living accordingly to what the flesh is telling them. Their flesh is telling them. Their own fleshly and lustful minds are telling them. So that God is getting ready to make judgment, to cause judgment to fall upon Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And so Abraham here is uh, interacting with God and pleading for God to spare the city. Uh, and we, let us read that. He says that he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet but this once. And before that, he had said the same thing to God, asking God uh, if, if he found a certain number that would he spare the, uh, the city. And God said, yes. And this is his last request. He's asking God, don't be angry with me. I'm just going to ask one more time. Because in Abraham's mind, he's counting up the minimal that he thinks would be there uh, so that God could spare the city. And sometimes in our minds, we think that it has to be, there should be at least this amount of folk that's standing up for what's right. There should be at least the folk in the church that's standing up for what's right. There should be this amount of pastors, at least, that are preaching the truth of God to the people of God and to those that are uh, in their congregations. It should be at least this amount. And we're asking God to forgive. We're asking God to spare. We're asking God to not destroy, not to judge, not to bring on uh, punishment. And so Abraham says, uh, I will speak yet but this once, peradventure, or perhaps 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. Now, this is a testimony to the depravity of, of man. And this is a testimony of how low a society could seek could sink into depravity and into uh, debauchery. Uh, it just shows how 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 bad off we could get from where we were uh, so quickly. Uh, Thirty years ago, if someone would have told any of us that things that we're seeing happening right now. Uh, people walking into retail stores and loading up carts uh, uh, with with whatever they want to load up and they're just walking out past the cash register. Don't even stop to pay for them. Just walk out of the store and put the stuff in their car and dare you to say anything to them. And they just drive off, just stealing. It's not theirs. They didn't pay for it. It's stealing. That's what it's called. And God says in his word, thou shalt not steal. And coming into the, you say, well, that's the Old Testament. Well, let's come to the New Testament. Paul says, he that stole, let him steal no more. You Christians, you that have stole, don't steal anymore. That's New Testament. And yet, these folks will go in and do it. And who knows how many will sit in the congregation on Sunday saying amen to the preacher as he uh, begins to preach or she begins to preach, whatever it may be. But uh, how many of those will be singing in the choir that have committed such an act? And it's not just with stealing, but we look around us and we see violence. We see uh, lying and, and, and we see cheating. We see uh, people that are, uh, can no longer keep promises. They're promise breakers. And uh, we see all of this going on. They have no respect not only for each other, but they have no respect for themselves. But we need to repent before it's too late. Jeremiah, the fifth chapter. Beginning at the first verse. And we're gonna we're gonna deal with this and then we'll come back to the fifth chapter of Jeremiah. It says run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executed judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. It's hard for us to even find, find uh, prosecutors, DAs, that will prosecute criminals. The police will catch them, they'll bring them in and charge them, but then the DAs will turn around and, and set the charges aside and, and refuse to prosecute. And the thieves go right back out. We have judges that refuse to, to uh, set bail and say uh, no cash bails. We got legislatures that, that will, will have passed laws saying uh, no cash bail. So you can't even uh, keep murderers in. You can't keep uh, these thieves in. Uh, these perpetrators of, of uh, crimes, you can't even keep them in jail. They they walk right out. 
and then they don't show up for court. And you have this that's going on in city after city after city after city. And we wonder why our society is the way it is. Well, we'll say, well, that's because uh, they've uh, uh, prosecuted too many people of color, too many people uh, of uh, that, that can't afford bail. Well, if you can afford to commit a crime, uh, too too bad if you can't afford to, to uh, post bail. You should have thought about that before you committed the crime. And yet, uh, and there are people that are going to be watching this, going to listen to this, going to look at me and say, well, pastor, why are you saying that? How, why are you talking like that? Where's your love? My love is for the standards of God. My love is for the standards of right. My love is for also the victims that are uh, the victims of this crime, the victim of these abuses, the victims of these uh, 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 situations where uh, good is called evil and evil is called good. My love is for them to uh, because we should be willing and seeking and trying to do what is right. That's the benefit for all of us. That's the blessing for all of us. And then for those that are are tried or brought up on charges and, and they are, are given uh, a punishment that is compensatory to the crime that they've committed, there is a possibility of them uh, being, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, by being brought to justice as a possibility of them uh, recognizing that the acts that they have done is wrong and they can turn from their wicked ways. They can repent before it's too late. God doesn't let the sinner off the hook because the sinner is, is poor. God doesn't let the sinner off the hook just because they are uh, uh, have fallen in with the wrong crowd and, and they don't have a, a father in the home. They don't have a mother in the home. They don't have uh, uh, adequate uh, employment. Uh, they had a bad life, unfair life. God don't let them off the hook for sins because of that. He tells us to repent before it's too late. God is there to help. God is there to deliver. God is there to save. But you have to want to be saved. You have to want to, to, to change your situation, to change your attitude, to change your mindset, to change your heart set. You have to be willing to turn from your wicked ways and turn to right rather than evil. And God will help you. But if you don't, then God is going to have to judge you. Repent before it's too late. He tells us here, if you could find a man or woman, for that matter, if there be any that executed judgment, justice, that's what he's talking about here, that speaks the truth, that seeks the truth, rather, and I will pardon it. Are they seeking the truth or are they seeking reelection? Are they seeking the truth or are they seeking power for themselves? Are they seeking the truth or are they seeking to just please those donors to their election campaign? Are they seeking the truth? If they're not seeking the truth, but they're seeking other things rather than the truth, they got the wrong candidate. No matter how it makes you feel, no matter what label is on their ticket. We should be seeking those who are abiding by the principles or trying to at least abide by the principles that are laid out in the word of God. The principles of justice, the principle of, of righteousness, the principles of decency, the principles of truth, the principles of love, the principles of peace. Those are the things that we should be supporting. We need to repent before it's too late. Scripture also tells us, John is writing to us and says, strengthen not the hand of the evildoer. And yet we do that all the time, unfortunately. And I'm talking to folk who, who label themselves as Christians. The world is going to be the world. And they're not going to listen to this if they want to stay the world. But there are people that want to do what's right. And they'll listen to this. But there are people also that label themselves as Christians and being church members and all, but they are not going to receive this to their own uh, shame. 
They need to repent before it's too late. Let's go to Luke. The 13th chapter. Let's go to the second verse. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Of those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fed, fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? And he's talking to these folk because uh, there was this group of people who had come to, to Jerusalem during the time of the sacrifice and and uh, they were rioters and, and they were rebellious and, and Pilate ordered his uh, uh, soldiers to uh, disperse with them, even to the point that uh, many of them were killed because uh, of their rebellion and because uh, they were commanded to disperse and they didn't, and some were rioters. In any way, uh, the, uh, the Roman soldiers to, uh, uh, to establish uh, the rule of order came in and they killed them. And even to the extent to where their blood, the blood of the, the people that were killed were mixed in with the blood of the sacrifices that were being offered up. And Jesus asked the question, said, uh, you suppose that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans? I want to let you know something. Whether you're a sinner or a saint, we die. Whether we're a sinner or a saint, we get sick. Whether we're a sinner or a saint, bad things happen in life. Somebody say, well, well, it's not fair. Well, life is not fair. It's not always rosy. It's not always sunshiny. There's some, the, the, the same storm that hit the, the sinners hits the saints too. But the difference is this, that the saints can pray and the storms can be diverted, not just for them, them but also for the, their neighbors, those that live with them. The saints can pray and disease and sickness can be healed, not just for them, but also the neighbors that are with them. The saints can pray and trouble and destruction can be averted, not just for them, but for those that are around them. Because Jesus said, let your light so shine before men everywhere that they will see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. If our light is shining, it's not only a light to us, but it'll be the light to those that are in darkness. They talked about that when the scripture talks about that, when Jesus went forth preaching the kingdom and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then it says that the prophecies that were spoken of in Isaiah that said about those that dwelt in the land of Zebulun has seen in darkness, has seen now a great light. Why? Because the, the Son of God, the righteous one, was speaking to them, was preaching to them, was sharing with them. The light that was in him shone on them. So those things happen, but also because of sin, not because God being being uh, incompetent or being bad or, or, or whatever that things are happening to people, but because sin is in the environment, sin is in the world, sin permeates everything. And as a result of that, that sin can cause things that uh, on its surface doesn't seem to be right or fair. It can cause it to happen. So life isn't fair. And I'm gonna take it a step further. Do you think it was fair for someone to die for your sins who knew no sin? Do you think it was fair for him to suffer for you in your stead? Do you think it was fair for him to give his life so that you might have life and have it more abundantly? Do you think that's fair? No, it's not fair. And yet, was it necessary? Yes, it was necessary for us to be able to recognize that we were sinners and we deserve judgment. And yet, 
we are able to recognize through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross that God granted us grace, unmerited favor. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. God gave it to us because he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's not fair. And yet it is necessary. It is needed. And thank God for Jesus. I want it because I want the salvation that is of Jesus Christ. I repented before it was too late. Jesus says, except we repent, we will like all likewise perish. Let's go back to Jeremiah chapter five. I'm going to read to you. from the New English translation, verse two, these people make promises in the name of the Lord, but the fact is what they swear to is really a lie. We have people that talk, come to church and they talk about God and how much they love him, but they really don't love him because they don't obey him. They won't do his will. They don't promote his character, his righteousness, his holiness. They don't promote it. They promote their own flesh, their emotion. They put their emotions and their feelings above God's word and his truth. Verse three, Lord, I know you look for faithfulness. This is Jeremiah talking. But even when you punish these people, they feel no report, remorse. Uh, God uses uh, circumstances in the, in the environment. He'll send storms and they still won't repent. There was a time I remember in my own life when storms would come and people would fill up the churches and repent because they were afraid of the storms that would come and war would come and the same thing. People would fill up churches and ask God's forgiveness so that we would come out as victors. Not anymore. Diseases would hit pandemics and they would pray and ask God for deliverance and for healing and all because they wanted to be saved. They wanted to live. Not anymore. It seems like when the storms come, the churches are less. We come up with an excuse not to come to church. It seems like when the uh, uh, war starts, instead of us giving glory to God, we give glory to our weapons. We give glory to our military. We give glory to our government instead of giving the glory to God. Thank God for men and women in the uniform. I was one of them. So I understand that importance. But we're able to do what we're able to do because of the grace of God and the, and the blessings of God and his empowerment and his protection. There are many of us in uniform that knew if it wasn't for the hand of God, we would have been swept away. We would have failed. But it was God's grace that saved us. Even in, our, in the conflicts, it was God's grace, God's goodness that won as opposed to the evils of our enemies. Even when you nearly destroy them, they refuse to be corrected. There are people that even on their deathbed refuse to repent until it's too late. And they still refuse to repent. They leave out of here refusing to repent. They have become as hard-headed as a rock. They refuse to change their ways. We're living with it. This is the reality that we deal with. I thought, surely it is only the ignorant poor who act this way. They act like fools because they do not know what the Lord demands. This is verse four. They do not know what their God requires of them. Sometimes we look at it and say, well, they just don't know. We'll make an excuse for them and say, they just don't know. But that's no excuse. Look at this. I will go to the leaders and speak with them. Surely they know what the Lord demands. I'm going to go to the preachers. I go to the pastors and speak to them. They know what the truth is. Surely they know what their God requires of them. Yet all of them too have rejected his authority and refused to submit to him. So like a lion from the thicket, their enemies will kill them. Like a wolf from the desert, they will destroy them. Like a leopard, they will lie in wait outside the cities and totally destroy anyone who ventures out. For they have rebelled so much and done so many unfaithful things. We got pandemics that happen like this. Folks are, are 
destroyed, folks uh, maimed, folks are uh, in, immobilized because of disease and sickness and afflictions and still refuse to repent before it's too late. For they have rebelled so much and done so many unfaithful things. Now, this happens in the world, but I'm not dealing with just the world. I'm dealing with just, I'm dealing with church. We have folk in our churches that are dying from sicknesses and disease that they don't have to if they would repent before it's too late. The Lord asks, how can I leave you unpunished, Jerusalem? And he's saying that to America. How can I leave you unpunished? How can I lead you un leave you unjudged? We have killed more babies. And all y'all don't like to hear this. Some of y'all don't like to hear this because some of you might be guilty of it. And you say, well, I don't like to hear this. Baby, if you are guilty of this, all you have to do is repent before it's too late. God's ear is open to you. But we have killed over 60 million babies since Roe versus Wade was granted by the Supreme Court in the 70s, early 70s. Over 60 million. That's more than all of the of the uh, men and women that died, the service folks that died in our wars, in all of our wars combined. 60 million babies that couldn't speak for themselves. And you mean to tell me that God is going to overlook that and not judge? this nation for that? You're not living in reality. You're still living in la-la land and fantasy land. The Lord asks, how can I leave you unpunished, Jerusalem? Your people have worshiped gods that are not gods at all. You're worshiping your bank accounts. You're worshiping your, your possessions, your homes, your cars. You're worshiping your relationship, your, your boyfriends, girlfriends. You're worshiping your spouses. You're worshiping your children. You're worshiping everything but the true God, the one and the only one that is worthy to receive worship. You're worshiping everything but him. You're also worshiping things that have no life, things that, that are just, we're worshiping any kind of thing. We're worshiping our flesh, our desires, and we'll protect that. We'll, we'll, we'll worship it to the death. But we need to repent before it's too late. Even though I reply, I supplied all their needs, they were like an unfaithful wife to me. They went flocking to the houses of prostitutes and lovers. Check out Hosea. He'll tell you about that. They are like lusty, well-fed stallions. Each of them lusts after his neighbor's wife. I will surely punish them for doing such things, says the Lord. I will surely bring retribution on such a nation as this. The Lord commanded the enemy, march through the vineyards of Israel and Judah and ruin them, but do not destroy them completely. Here, even then, in God's judgment, he still opens up, leave open the door to repentance. Strip off their branches, for these people do not belong to the Lord. For the nations of Israel and Judah have been very unfaithful to me, says the Lord. These people have denied what the Lord says. And Judah and Israel represents the world. They represent the nations of the world, including America today. And the societies that have thrown off worship of God, thrown off honoring God, thrown off obedience to God. These people have denied what the Lord says. They have said, that is not so. When God's word says something, they re, they reject it and say, no, that's not so. No harm will come to us. We will not experience war and famine. This is verse 12. In verse 13, the prophets will prove to be full of wind. You hear all these folks running around talking about they got a word from the Lord. They got a word in these churches. And you have people running behind them. They're going about around <clears throat> doing these revivals and all this stuff. And people following them. And they're saying everything is all good good to go. It's going to be all right. So the Lord has not spoken through them. So let what they say happen to them. 
Because of that, the Lord, the God who rules over all said to me, because these people have spoken like this, I will make the words that I put in your mouth like fire. I will make this people like wood, which the fiery judgments you speak will burn up. I know some of you ain't liking what I'm saying, but I'm going to say it anyhow. And I'm saying it not because I'm angry with you or uh, because I'm trying to to uh, condemn you or, or judge you for using myself as a standard. I need to repent before it's too late. Whenever I fall short, I need to repent. I need to confess my sin, knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. This is what has to happen. When I talk to you like this, I'm talking to you because I care about you. I want your soul saved. I want you to know the joy, the peace, the blessings of Jesus Christ. I don't want you to suffer in the devil's hell for eternity. I want you to spend eternity in the presence of the almighty, the creator God who loves us with an everlasting love. The Lord says, listen, nation of Israel, and I could, I could put America in, in the place of Israel. I am about to bring a nation from, from far away to attack you. It will be a nation that was founded long ago and has lasted for a long time. Hello, somebody. It will be a nation whose language you will not know. Its people will speak words that you will not be able to understand. Y'all better get ready. and You better repent before it's too late. All of his soldiers are strong and mighty. Their arrows will send you to your grave. Their weapons will send you to your grave. Why are you talking about pronouns and wokeness? They're preparing for war. They will eat up your crops and your food. They're buying up your property. Right before your eyes. They will kill it because we got people that are too greedy. They're so greedy for money that they could care less about the security of the nation. They will eat up your sheep and your cattle. They will destroy your vines and your figs trees. You better wake up, America. You better wake up and repent before it's too late. Their weapons will batter down the fortified cities you trust in. Yet even then, I will not completely destroy you, says the Lord. So then, Jeremiah, when your people ask, why has the Lord our God done all this to us? Tell them, it is because you rejected me and serve foreign gods in your own land. So you must serve foreigners in a land that does not belong to you. Proclaim this message among the descendants of Jacob. Make it known throughout Judah. Tell them, hear this, you foolish people who have no understanding, who have eyes but do not discern, who have ears but do not perceive. And I'm talking to those that are that supposed to know. I'm talking to you church folk. You say, well, what are you talking about? Why are you telling me? Because as a bishop in the Lord's church, I am called to confront the culture and defend the faith. You should fear me, says the Lord. You should tremble in awe before me. I made the sand to be a boundary for the sea, a permanent barrier that it can never cross. Notice a hurricane when it makes landfall, it loses its power. No matter how powerful it is, as it comes inland, it loses its power. According to the amount of distance that it travels inland, it loses power because God set a boundary. And there it is right before our eyes, and yet we cannot see that we need to repent before it's too late. Its waves may roll, but they can never prevail. They may roll, but they can never cross beyond that boundary. But these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They have turned aside and gone their own way. They do not say to themselves, let us revere the Lord our God. It is he who gives us the autumn rains and the spring rains at the proper time. It is he who assures us of the regular weeks of harvest. Your misdeeds have stopped these things from you. These things from coming. Your sins have deprived you of my bounty. Reason you're not blessed because you, and reason you're not healed because you haven't repented before it's too late. Indeed, there are wicked scoundrels among my people. I'm pulling the covers off. They lie in wait like bird catchers hiding in ambush. They set deadly traps to catch people. Paul said this when he was speaking to the church. He said, I know after my department, departure, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. 
Not sparing the flock. They, they're with us. They're sitting in our pulpits. They're sitting on our deacon boards. They're sitting in, in the ushers uh, council. They're sitting in the financial councils. They're sitting right there in the pew with you. Like a cage filled with birds, verse 27, that have been caught. Their houses are filled with the gains of their fraud and deceit. That is how they have gotten so rich and powerful. Let me put it like this. They preach a prosperity gospel, name it, claim it, but they don't preach the true holiness of God. They don't preach about uh, walking away from your sins. They don't preach about uh, uh, turning away from your sins and turning to Christ and seeking God's righteousness. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not your prosperity, but his righteousness. And all these things, everything that you need will be added to you. That is how they have grown fat and sleek. There is no limit to the evil things they do. In their own little clique, they do everything. They do things that, that are too shameful to even talk about. They do not plead the cause of the fatherless in such a way as to win it. They don't care about it. You got it all through the courts. We got courts that don't uphold what is right and justice. We're talking about blind justice. Justice is supposed to be blind from the standpoint of not favoring the rich over the poor. But the justice that we got, she's peeking out from underneath that blindfold to see who's got the money and who doesn't have the money. That's what we're dealing with, saints. But we need to repent before it's too late. God's justice, though, goes where it needs to go. God's justice punishes the wicked and rewards the righteous. It's God's justice. They do not defend the rights of the poor. Verse 29, I will certainly punish them for doing such thing, say the Lord. I will certainly bring retribution on such a nation as this. Something horrible and shocking is going on in the land of Judah or the land of America. The prophets prophesy lies. The priests exercise power by their own authority. Politics is in the pulpit. Politics is across the board with the bishops. Politics is, is across the board with those that are exercising uh, the preaching. And my people love to have it this way. My people are voting for folk that hate me. My people are choosing folk that have undermined my word. My people are casting Folks empower people who refuse to repent before it's too late. But they will not be able to help you when the time of judgment comes. Repent, saints, before it's too late. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, repent. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Ask him to be your Lord and your savior. Cast your trust and your faith in him and him alone. And if you know the Lord as your savior, repent before it's too late and ask God to restore you in the beauty of his holiness. Saints, it's not too late yet, but it's getting close. Evening. It's getting close. It's evening time. Night is drawing near. Repent while it is still day. For the night comes and no man can work. Father, help us to repent. You said in your word, godly sorrow, work its repentance not to be repented of. Give us that godly sorrow. And we are sorry for our sins. That we're sorry for doing wrong, for being disobedient. Help us to see where we're wrong, Father. And help us to be sorry for it. Help us to call on your name. For your word says, whosoever would call upon your name would not be ashamed. Help us, Lord, to do the right thing. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to forget the things that are behind. 
I have no pride in the things that I failed in. I have none. I have no defense of the sins that I've committed. But as the scripture said, let every man be a liar and God be true. So let everybody fall short and let God's glory find them and lift him up. For you said that you are our glory and the lifter up of our heads. So Father, restore us. Restore. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you, saints. Until next time, go with God.